Hello and welcome to The Skating Lesson. I'm Dave Lees. And I'm Jonathan Byer. Look at us with our black and white theme today. Uh, I know, I love I've it. Got, I've got flowy linen white because it's like 50 degrees outside, but you've got like very sleek, very, very chic looking black. This is nice. <laughs> it was a present for someone else for Christmas that became a present to me. They didn't deserve it, I did. Yeah. So it's great, yes. Oh. Boom. <laughs> the best guy to present. I love it. So yeah. Well, this is this and that. We are going to be discussing our 2022 recap, our 2023 preview. This is this and that. So for all of you who are new here, please subscribe below. Smash that like button. Yes, give us love. And <laughs> and I finally got new art. This it's I been a solid. Gonna... It's so funny. Sit back in the center again. And it looked like this like beautiful like hair piece coming out. Like it was like very Vivian Westwood. <laughs> no. And and I think honestly, you know how we used to have Tessa Virtue appear to give us? Correct. John Curry is here to be horrified by what a cherry two breeds has done to the sport. Okay. And in a nice tie-in for me, where is that from? Um, this is from the Met, July 24th to the 29th. Okay, I heard it's a place you like to go. Yes, perhaps I've been a couple times. Um, sung on the stage, it's very large, but I'm impressed that they brought in real ice. And it was so funny because I went to a birthday party at the top of the William Vale Hotel in Brooklyn and they were they got like a little chalet and you can have dinner and drinks there. And then you can go skating on the rooftop. Mm -hmm. Dave, it was like an air hockey table. It was like this crazy weird plastic Right. And I guess because obviously they can't have like Zambonis and stuff up there or keep it cool when it's so warm out. Um, but it was horrifying to see. I didn't even get on it, the ice, because it was like so horrible and everyone was falling all over the place. I respect all of these like former competitors that go to these sort of outdoor places to like do a, an exhibition to start them because I don't know how they can skate on that. Well, Michelle Kwan performed on plastic ice once in like Singapore. Maybe it was like one of the last times she performed. I think she did Winter Song there. Does anyone remember this? I think it was in Singapore. Okay. I, I think she was on Gleis there. I mean, no joke. I don't know how anyone can do anything on it. I'm Is that joking. what they're on at Radio City? Yeah, the, when the pair yes. comes out? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Which is but why they kind of do limited things. And at they first do like the lift that like yeah. moves around. Yeah. yeah. So. But, but the Met probably for him brought in some like real fancy ice. That's. I don't think, I don't think Sir John Curry was going on plastic ice. I don't think so. Oh. <laughs> he seemed really easygoing, right? He yeah, seemed... yeah. Just chill, just chill. And it's funny because we're going to talk about also this freeze uh, show that we watched on YouTube. And I was thinking back to like, gosh, what a different era of great British skating that was. You had yeah. John Curry, then you had Robin Cousins, and you had Torval and Dean. And I was, wow, what a different, a different time that must have been. Well, we've heard about Sheffield through John Wilson Blades and a little bit with skating, but And I've heard this from people that have trained there. They said it has like a vibe of hack and sack without the competitive intensity in the same way, but it has that kind of heavy vibe of hack and sack. Okay. Um, especially like, well, hack and sack is getting rebuilt right now. So they're building all these luxury condos and things in the hopes of maybe it will turn down. But when you drive to hack and sack, like you're driving through like run down like old streets, right? Like. It feels like the song, you know, you're you're just, you're like in it and like the grit, right? And yeah. in Sheffield, you know, um, I see the wheels turning, Dave. <laughs> I think it's gonna come out, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it seems like a hot mess and not in a positive way. It seems perhaps slightly oppressive and- um, Yeah like a well, place to escape you know i understand why these skaters are going to other countries i believe olivia smart rose from the ashes to become spanish through there yeah. yes yeah mm -hmm. and wait just a quick side note about olivia because she announced the new partnership with the german partner but yes I, I they're really still going to be spanish they are still going to be spanish it's like how aliona was so german you know ukrainian aliona brought in a frenchman and they were still german right okay 
Okay, because he was German and then I thought, oh, are they going to compete under Germany? But, and some of the articles even said as much, but, but we know that it is in fact going to be for Spain. And meanwhile, okay. we're working on this, but there are some country, there are some skaters that are lining up backup options for country representation should Russia be out. But if you watch the recent As the Blade Turns, it seems unclear if they were Russia will remain out. And I know people don't want to believe that with the war. And I would really um, look at what the US OPC is saying, because why is America of all countries kind of saying, well, maybe we should let Russia back. Maybe they were banned and that's okay. And we mm -hmm. should let them back. And I would have to, what do you think the motivation would be? for the US OPC to want to bring back Russia. I don't, for me, I can't even read deeper into it because it sounds so baffling to me. So they can be held accountable for previous stuff in order to come back? What do you think? And it's like, it's one of the things where you start to go deep into the Olympic movement and you think about where, how is the Olympic movement funded? Who, who fund, and looking into uh -huh. the, who funds the majority of the Olympic movement? Is it Russia? No, NB oh. NBC via its corporate sponsors. That's how they get the times moved and a lot of these things. And then there's backlash against the US for funding everything and feeling like they have an oversized hand, right? But the Olympics are sold traditionally as kind of the US versus Russia. East versus West, like Cold War status. And though the Cold War is over, the political tensions are surely not between these countries. Mm. So if NBC needs a rival, you, I mean, yes, there are sporting rivals, but Russia is the rival to the US on every level, right? Mm. Terribly, economically. Sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And Though China is a rival, it's in a different kind of less aggressive, less overt way. And they also don't match up in every sport. And they, I think it's one of those things, but it, it's at a certain point, will the public turn off the games if they aren't? I think we'd have to look at, well, do they really turn off major league sports when people are doping or doing a baseball, you know, I mean, Right. Yankees still, maybe they have a dip, but it seems to. <laughs> There's a couple. Well, I mean, see, even on Twitter, which I am barely on these days, it's um, they did a, an article about Valieva's Wednesday Adams program. Yeah. And there was a big backlash from, mm -hmm. from a lot of people saying, like, why are we highlighting and featuring and celebrating this performance, keeping in mind that this is the this is the person that was at the at the core of the scandal and why there are did any of those places take it down oh i'm sure not yeah because if they got the clicks it was a success successful article and that backlash is just and as we know whether they're angry clicks and comments or positive kicks uh, clicks and comments it's still pushing it forward it's still readership it's still viewership it's still thanks for watching yeah uh, exactly. <laughs> Well, the most telling thing to me was think about the Today Show. It is always the biggest cheerleading outlet in the morning. If Nathan Chen has a book coming out like he did, or he wins, or Simone Biles is doing a new charity event, they always get interviewed by Savannah and Hoda, right? Or Hoda and Jenna, and they love them, right? But today's show is NBC. NBC right. is really supposed to be pro-US. And the today the NBC certainly knows about Valieva and what they did. But, and they know that Russia is banned, of course. Right. But they also knew that Valieva was going to, um, you know, did this Wednesday program. And that that got viral clicks and that that was content. So really that shows you ratings and money are what the whole thing is about. Right.
is anyone really caring about clean sport? Right. Do they care about making it believable, making it not too overt, like not getting caught? Like, you know, what the real motivations are, I think, I think you could see it's, I mean, I think there are probably warring factions and ideas within organizations about who thinks about what. But I think at the end of the day, they have, unless the sponsors were going to say, you cheated, we want nothing to do with your brand, another sponsor would line up to get that opportunity. Right. right. Or another outlet would post the Wednesday Adams video and then blah, blah, blah. They're getting all the clicks. Yeah. I mean, I have an inherent distrust of those sort of mega organizations that they don't even understand the sport that they cover. Do you know what I mean? That it just becomes such a general coverage. They're not really into the nuance of who is who and why something could be problematic. They're just pumping out material. Well, think about this. When Tanya Harding was be was believed, accused, alleged to have been involved on the attack on Nancy Kerrigan. You know, Triple Axe of 1996 is all those old clips up, right? You don't hear many of the outlets going, how dare she be able to compete? Right. How dare someone like that be they able to- They want the showdown, yeah. They wanted the showdown. With Russia being a country that dopes a 15 year old girl, does it just make them a bigger villain? Is that part of why they let her compete? Like what happens behind the scenes where there, did someone go, holy shit, this is amazing for ratings? Mm. Because yeah. it's not just the TV ratings, right? Who's watching the live stream? Who's watching Peacock? Who's And is that all adjusted? Because oftentimes they will say, well, the TV ratings were down, but these Olympics for NBC were still the most profitable. So what really matters? Do they really care then, right? As long as they're getting their ad rates and their ad sales. I right. don't know if they yeah. actually really care. So, well, and the people that are riled up in those moments are usually such fans of the sport in general. They're still tuning in. You know what I mean? Like even we've had different response on why are you watching things that are happening in Russia this season? Shouldn't you just just not be interested at all? And it was like, but at the end of the day, we are very interested in the sport itself. Mm -hmm. To the point where, yes, I'm going to watch what's happening there. I may not love it, and I may may have problems with some sort of unresolved issues from the previous season, but I'm still gonna tune in and see what who's doing what. Yeah. Yeah. Someone tried to argue to me that the figure skating competitions are funding the war. And I was like, the figure skating competitions and those sponsors are keeping figure skating alive in that country. Now you could argue that that is potentially money that could go elsewhere, but these are like very, very distant arguments. Yeah, and money I think that that's, yeah. It's an overinflated idea of what the sport can do for them. But yes. yeah, yeah. Um, and also, I mean, it is true. I mean, so the U.S. did invade Iraq and Afghanistan, although it wasn't against the Olympic Charter at the time. And, the, you know, there are different nuances here and people throw all sorts of arguments out. And again, the argument being that the the sport itself is the, the, my go to in those conversations is the sports for us in the United States, figure skating in particular, is not government affiliated. Yes, no. they, yes, they represent the United States, but as we have seen with all of that cross-pollination in Russia, it's very different um, yeah. that the government's actions are a part of the sport there, mm. and that is not the case in the US. Well, it also has to do with what happens to the athletes and Lance Armstrong and his never-ending court battles. I mean, some of that is because his some of his funding obviously came from the U.S. Postal Service, and what kind of federal issues do you have there? Uh, and different athletes have broken federal laws. I mean, Marion Jones went to jail for lying about doping to a grand jury. Uh, so I, I don't, I haven't heard about any legal issues for Camila in Russia. I, right. You know, it hasn't really been a discussion that has yeah. you know in the press that we've read. So I mean, yeah, I'm very interested to see what will happen, but I. I think we're going to see how independent are these bodies, right? Can you imagine if they allow Russia to come back and they were to just to swipe this under the rug and allow 
the Russians to keep their figure skating team gold medal. After all of this, I think there might be some damage to the brand of the Olympics, at least at first, depending on how close that decision was made and if they choose to have the medal ceremony in 2024, right? If the Russians are to keep their team gold medal and they're to allow Russia back, I think that the IOC would have to um, have that ceremony separate, uh, not close to the public, not you know, not have them come out during the opening ceremonies and have Madison Hubble get a silver medal. I don't think that that would go over well for a marketing and branding moment. Now, no. if they were to give Madison Hubble a gold medal and Russia was going to be allowed back in, I think that might be a little bit more palatable to hmm. people yeah. if they are. They're the not armies. getting away with everything. Yeah, yeah. Because again, even, even with the fans that we talk to or read their comments, they seem to forget that Russia is not banned because of the doping scandal. Right. The, 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 right. As of now, there really is no, no accountability for that doping scandal. But Suzanne Lyons of the USOPC, when she was asked, should Russia be banned for the war or for doping? Her response was yes. So though, ostensibly they're banned for the war, did most ban them because this was like the last straw of a series of things that they did. And that to me feels wrong then because then it becomes about the war and then letting them back in. But if you're not banning them for the real reasons that you really are banning them, and this is an excuse, it's just this whole circular argument that you get into. Because right. every article about them let in also has them do with the doping. So, and can Rusada even be trusted, which Wada is saying, no, but we can't yeah. ban them any longer. So, yeah, but the wheels seem to be in motion for, a, there's a collision course coming up. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it's so funny. Russia was banned from the Olympics in non Olympic years, <laughs> right? That, that, exactly. That's exactly. They may have reduced participation, but I would be even curious to see what kind of allowances, because, okay, because Russia did not compete at the world championships, when they are allowed back in, they should only have one entry. Right. Are they going to stick to it? I, I, I tend to think that they should. Will yes. they allow you? Yeah. I don't know if the ISU. Otherwise, it wasn't really a consequence. That's part of the consequence of not competing. I mean, it would be interesting to see them have to earn some of those spots back, right? That would be humbling. Yeah. I'd certainly extra test those athletes as well. Right. Make another Neville Horn moment. Yeah. Yeah. And see how uh, things go. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know, I'm curious to see what would happen, but I do think that if we were gonna talk about Sheffield and 2022. I do think that some of the biggest moments, I mean, I think what happened with the doping has really overshadowed the sport for the entire year because it is so intertwined for everyone. Right, right. And their absence is absolutely, um, like it's kind of like, the unspoken thing at any competition. It's like, hello, pink elephant. <laughs> like, what's right, happening? Right. And, and I was impressed, even, even in the the Freeze documentary where it was following the, the British team, they did have some of their female skaters say, well, look at me. I am not a 15-year-old teeny tiny prepubescent girl from from Russia. I cannot, I cannot bring that. Mm -hmm. So I have to figure out what I can do. Yeah. And it, it's sort of this looming thing for everyone in every country at every stage of it, you know? What have been your favorite skating moments of 2022 so far? Of 2022, you know, I mean, sadly, as we, we were talking about this before, of course, the, the calendar year slices right in the middle of the season, right? Yeah, it's so a weird as season. I look, as I look back to like the 21-22 season, I had many highlights that were actually in the fall of 21. For instance, yeah. this rise of Wakaba that was the fall of 21, I unfortunately was not mirrored in um, the calendar year of 22. I think that um, watching Sway and Han mm -hmm. win, win their goal was very fulfilling for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that Kauri's- Was it stated a little better when they won it? 
Yeah, I know. Sometimes you take what you can get. <laughs> Again, because we've also discussed the Olympics being its own competition, but somehow yet we do like to view it as a lifetime achievement award. And that was for sure one of the smallest. Yes. Um, but I have to say, Kauri, Kauri getting the bronze medal was very exciting and her subsequent world championship and the rise Although of- Although she skated better at the Olympics than she did at the world championships. And I think it was a more satisfying performance, but yeah. yes. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of other ladies in particular. I thought the, the rise of Lena, which was happening that fall, but we really saw in the beginning of 2022 was exciting because it's been a while since we've seen that kind of um, rise up, which was, which was really, really nice. I have to say Papadakis and Ciceron at the Olympics was just out of this world. Yes. Out of this world for me. Yeah, their free really came alive in that moment. Yes. And yes. Nathan's moment was far more emotional, I think, to see a, an athlete like that who had fought back, who actually to see someone who had a lot of pressure and potential to win in 2018, completely bombed. Right. And then to come back and do it and realize he was doing it in the moment was very thrilling to watch. Um, yeah. But almost just as satisfying for me was watching Shoma pull out the bronze, which for him was him winning the gold, like how Nathan did. I, I think him him doing as well and then and then riding that wave to the to the worlds also was a remarkable story. And then him. still riding it now. And yeah. still improving. I think that is the biggest uh, thing with Shoma is that he's taken that world title and almost like done like a major meditation yoga session and like worked through it. And I think we're seeing Kauri work through it as well. And I think it's really exciting and fascinating to watch her ups and uh, as she's adjusted to being world champion and probably didn't think that was possible based on the way she reacted to the bronze medal when Terry was going for a sweep for her to pull that off and subsequently win and then have this forward momentum and kind of deal with maybe her own upper limit, right? Of can she be this leading star? I think it's really interesting. And then to see her try to evolve stylistically in her refinement with Roheen and Marie France has been one of the most interesting storylines of the season, especially because people hated the programs at first. Then they start to debate now if the short is better or the free is better. And people are really mixed on that and which is the better program. But And, and it, it's a testament to those athletes that it, there's always more growth to be done. They're pushing themselves even more outside of the comfort zone when it could have been easy to rest on your laurels, do more of the same and try to repeat again this year. To see yeah. them still trying to grow as artists is amazing to watch because yeah. they almost don't have to, but they, they, they took a very vulnerable risk in, in trying to grow from it. And so to see Kauri kind of navigate those waters has been very interesting this is legacy stuff right yeah. Uh, yeah yeah i think um otherwise women's skating hasn't been the, uh, the rise of mao shimada has been very pleasant and lovely i have to say that has been delightful uh to watch and a complete Yalem for me in the beginning of this season started to be an exciting story obviously it it has fizzled down a bit um, for whatever reason, but the, the beginning energy she came out with, especially with that short program and determination was also exciting to see because she was someone who I felt was a little bit looked over last season and to see her come out with such fight and dedication was inspiring to see. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um... I think in the men's event, we're starting to see some new interesting skaters, Lucas Broussard, uh, Nicola Memela, right? Like there's just some interesting skaters. Obviously Kevin Amos and Adam in France are really interesting to watch. Kazuki, although I have to say his La La Land was one of the best moments of last season. I yeah. like his program, not as much as I liked his programs last year, but I do like his spirit. Um, I'm excited to see Yuma continue to develop, hopefully. Um, Rinka Watanabe at the beginning of the season was interesting, has slid back, but hopefully she can recoup. Uh, 
And the Japanese pair also, I mean, like all things considered, their, their presence at the, at the top of the rankings is really a new thing. Yeah. It, it's been nice to see uh, the Japanese Federation rounding out that program. Yeah. Also, Deanna Stilato and Max, they're, uh, I mean, come on, the U.S., this is the truth, is that the U.S. did set up tryouts for her to like skate around with Brandon and Danny at a, that pair tryout where they, they would like invite boys to help out at like the cattle call tryout. And then, but didn't, you know, the, the phone calls from the judges who are involved behind the scenes um, were not the same phone calls that happened when Chris Kinnearum bowed out mid four continents and the call was made to um, right. team up with Alexa. Right. <laughs> right. That was very different than um, that conversation. Then it was very hard for her to even, she had to wait out years as she's getting older. And, right. I mean, this is the real story. And the US wasn't releasing her. Mm. They were in fact going to charge her money because this is a new policy is that when you want to get released now in the US as in, to prevent people from going to other countries so easily, right? They were going to charge her, they charge you for your career. So that starts back, you know, when you're a novice, like, because she was a talented, very talented novice skater, right? They look back and they don't reply to you right away. Like they take their sweet time for some skaters, right? Then they, you know, and she still can't get Canadian funding until she gets her full card and citizenship and stuff. So this is someone who's really, doing this for the love of the sport. At, yeah, it would have been very easy for other people, almost, eh, not worth it, bail, yeah. And everyone's going, oh, she's old, you know? So that, I think it's really exciting to watch that. And their quality is, is quite fantastic. She's actually been sick for like a month with all of this triple-demic stuff going on. So um, I, very thrilled and and really exciting to watch Alexa and Brandon also keep go. I mean, Alexa is the personality that is destined to fascinate us. We picked her early on in this early show. Early on, yeah. <laughs> we were, <laughs> you know, she's just um, a feisty one. Yes, I, uh, Jonathan, I think we will be 70 years old and talking about Alexa Kinnearum, right? Remember she Alexa? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I have to say, even you know, as always in in these calendar years, when you go from the Olympics and to see who who is going to stay and who is going to be motivated to stay or who is staying, but maybe they feel obligated to stay but they don't want to stay, I have to say, seeing Piper and Paul come out with such inspired material has also been very exciting as opposed to maybe some other people that have stayed around and maybe thought they'd just glide right into a world championship and didn't really put in that same amount of effort. Yeah, and I think it's interesting to watch Hubble really thrive in coaching, even though you wonder like, oh my goodness, could you and Zach, you watch, you're like, could you and Zach have had a moment this season, but then they seem to struggle with material. And then when you watch that Olympic show series, you're like, could they have? I don't know if they could yeah. have gotten along enough to come together with you. I mean, I'm sure they knew what the potential for this season would have been. And even, even amidst that potential decided it was not going to be worth it. Yeah. You know, watching that dynamic in that Olympic show documentary, I'm seeing the Whitney Houston movie after this. And I, I know it's not great, probably. And I'm a fan and they feel like the Bobby it. and Whitney of the ice dance world. Yes. And, um, Bravo. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, they're the exact opposite of Madison Chalk, who seems to be able to have Evan Bates wear matching outfits in whatever photo op she wants to uh, do on Instagram. <laughs> like, did you see the matching pajamas on Christmas? And the, you know, the new she knows how to make a look. That is for sure. She yeah, does. Right. And uh, Matthew is fantastic with her. So, oh. yeah. 
did did you see my new costume jonathan my new my uh, so it was the if, if i'm looking from the christmas show it was the bat the black with like the blue splash loved it yeah, it's blue um, it's actually dark blue pants so oh the, oh i see from the from the my phone it, it almost looked black but even more pretty you know what it is dave if i'm being honest <laughs> rinks have limitations as to how chic they can look at any given moment Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, a costume like that. I need the whole thing like back in Landover. Like I need the whole thing like. I mean, you don't like it with the, the blow up Christmas. <laughs> it's charming and it's whimsical. And that's what that is supposed to be. But for you in that outfit, I was like, I need black velvet everywhere. I need darkened lights. I need like this. You get a better video of the whole thing. It was the first pancake. It was very early to do what I'm trying to do this season and it was a step in the process and I'm going to do more competitions I think so yeah the, I'm, the, the, the costume was stunning well, thank stunning. you but yeah. I had a little bit of a Tanya moment why did, you, did your moment. neck come undone yeah. I don't know and it was my freaking fault okay um, Tanya would have never said that <laughs> listen I've for whatever reason, the button was not the same with the slits. So the whole thing is the pants. Matthew doesn't do a string, right? So you have like your pants are like fitted, but the whole thing is that like the pants go under the boot. There's a black strap. Remember when Sergey Grinkoff's strap right. came up? And this is how you right. like avoid real like boot covers, right? But the thing is, is that the buttons, they weren't, it wasn't like cut like usual. Mm. And I hadn't tried it on with my skates, which is my fault because I tried on the pants in my house and I was like, oh, it's great, it'll be great. It's yeah. so comfortable. But that was like the one missing thing. And right before I went to go, I like, put the button and I was like, cause you know, you take your skates off and you're like waiting. And I'm like, uh, like trying to run to find a scissor and then trying to like get it. And I'm like trying to pull it and like trying to rip it. Like, oh my God. Okay. And I was like, I had visions of like Sergey's strap coming and be like, I'm gonna be on my face. So like, yeah. not the mental moment of like right before you wanna go out and- Unless it was a welcome distraction to like jolt you out of your nerves. <laughs> yeah, and there's just been like a lot of other stuff going on in my life like for this. So like the stress level was like a little bit higher. <laughs> yeah, you could, have, you could have enjoyed a Zen moment instead of a wardrobe actually, moment. Like, I actually tried like meditating before I went out and I actually felt like pretty, calm but like with everything that happened I just didn't feel like in my body like a full mm. but you know what it's the first time and I've skated since and we're fine like uh, some things were good some things were not yet and that's what a first right. pancake is for yeah I'm working on changing some technique like with the way that I do my flip and like in the moment I felt my body like revert to an old habit my body like was like it's nope. gonna do what it knows in those moments yeah yeah so it was like a little early for me but I've been like I with another month of run-throughs, I think I'll feel pretty good. So, yeah. Nice, okay. Yeah. It was, but it was a definite like first pancake moment, but like some things are really good, so. Yeah. But I fell for the first time on nothing, on nothing. Oh, just like skating about, okay. Okay, so I'm not like a big smiler. With my ADHD, like I have to like focus more on the eyes, like so that I don't like, and even though I love skating, like it doesn't always like look like it. Mm. So Alexei will be like, who I work with, Bletsky will be like, did he smile? How many times in the program did he smile? And Kristen's like, he smiled, all right? <laughs> and you know, so, cause like I will run the program without all the jumps with her and then we do the whole thing with him and like to work on like, the skating quality. So I literally was like going to my footwork and I was like, okay, Alexei says a smile. And I went and I went to cross under <laughs> and boom, it was actually the first time I've fallen, but I was like very oh. disappointed. And like on my footwork, which is my favorite part of the whole program. So I was like pissed, disappointed. But then I was just like, well, it was gonna happen. <laughs> you know, yeah. like- I, And now you got it out of your system. Now you know it might happen and it did and you went on, yeah. Right, so my nephews were there. The little one was like falling asleep and the old one was like, yeah. Uncle Dave fell, but other people fell way more. That was his <laughs> review. <laughs> That's so funny. When I watched one of the events when I was visiting my nieces, they are obsessed with people who fall. And they were obsessed with following like the red and green boxes in the corner. And they were so excited. Who got a red box? Who got a red box? And I was like, oh, what an interesting take on all of this. Yeah. 
So Kristen and Igor's daughter and her partner, Patrick, skate with me in the mornings sometimes, especially over the last week. And, you know, they're the same age as my nephew. They're in fourth grade. They're nine, turning 10, right? And I always think, like, my nephew physically would be great, but, like, could he really get up at, like, five in the morning until seven and then come at, like, I don't know if he has the discipline or the intention yeah. for that kind of a thing. I mean, physically, he'd be phenomenal, right? But mm, it's... Okay. In terms of like the personality. Yeah, he, yeah, that drive is key. And he has to want that. Yeah. He has to want it and be able to like deal with people criticizing you all the time or not that they're, they're not mean, but they are st like they're disciplined with them in a way that I don't know if he would like that. Right. Especially if the whole family is not involved. So I wasn't, could he, he couldn't believe those kids were his age. He was like, mm that he was wowed over so yeah but that's so many of the stories of competitive skaters is they were first taken to a show or a birthday party and then they realized they could do something other kids were doing and then the rest was history but the weird thing is that because I'm older they always put me towards the end of the show and I'm like okay I'm the one adult skater here can't they like put me like in the beginning like you know like you know the dance recital like <laughs> You know, Igor's son. The trajectory. Like they were, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Like, and I said, Igor, what am I skating? He's like, oh, I think you're right before Lindsay. And I was like, oh, great. You know, yeah. 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 Nice opening act. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, I have any business doing that. Great. Yeah, that's <laughs> exactly <laughs> what I want. Oh, yeah. you know, what are you talking it about? Julia really requested that. Yeah. She did not. She wasn't there. The coaches don't usually go to the show unless they are putting like a ton of people on. That's the other. Yeah thing so and I think Lindsay was her only skater Sasha Fegan skated there because he takes but like which skaters are Montclair which ones at Hackensack have like shifted over the last year or so yeah it's been it's been like a interesting time between the rings so but I also have to say it's been interesting to follow your journey and who says what and what who really helps you with their um their advice and their approach and things like that as opposed to i have to be honest when we were watching some of that freeze documentary or how whatever their terminology is um they didn't seem to give much information uh coach dawn did not seem to give much technical information at all and um the jump technique of the skaters reflected that uh, there didn't seem to be a lot of jump technique happening uh, in the freeze show. Uh, when Nina went to do her triple loop and she's like outside of herself, I was, oh God. Yeah, like, and, then, and then, you know, what always irritates me is then when it's, it's chopped up to like, ah, she just needs to believe it or she's just really gonna want it more or something. And I was like, no, a lot of times people, I think actual information is required here. You, yes, I'm sure they would love to trust their technique but they need a proper technique in which to trust. Um, we were watching that with sort of the endless triple axle attempts with one of the men, and it was just sort of like, he's under rotating by uh, by almost three quarters of a revolution. I'm not really understanding Each what he in that triple axle. Although, yeah. So I really started noticing Graham Newberry during COVID because he was doing all those really cool things in his inline skates. I mean, he was doing like triple triples. Like It looked like on the boardwalk. I don't remember where he was doing it, but I just remember this kid from being so impressive with what he was doing in inline skates to keep his training going. He is very into, he makes me feel laid back, Jonathan. This scram is really, um, he's very serious about his, yeah. his, uh, his figure skating. Yes, uh, enjoyed that. Um, Billy French, that skater, um, lots of personality going on. Uh, that is that the right curly hair ice dancer? That's not Anthony. This is the ice dancer who was like working with Christopher Dean and that girl from the yes. U.S. Came. The blonde. Yes. And, and maybe Mark was working with them also. Yeah. He had different color hair. He had red hair and blonde hair and yeah. the real personality. Yeah. yeah. Um, he's in the U. I think he trains with Piper and Paul now mm. and but doesn't have a partner. Okay. That girl is engaged or married to her new partner. And I think they're representing Turkey is that situation. Oh, so, yeah. Okay. All right. How I stance, you know, <laughs> kids always fall in love, you know. Yeah, it's like the girl from Texas. Strategic, from strategic Texas? nationalities, you know. Yeah, okay, all right. Yeah, it's happening. Fascinating. Yeah. 
like there's a way you know there are reddit threads that you really you really have to go down if you've watched this show this this show is like i also found like mark henready to be fascinating you know i got the vibe that he doesn't think that ice dance team is very good that he's coaching but he's never there and it's uh he's you know off doing the show but i thought for someone that pops in and pops out he what i was most fascinated with how media trained he is from being on dancing on ice Yes. And you know what, Dave, I'm not going to lie. At that point in the show, I was ready for someone who knew how to talk to a camera. So in my- but very- He's performing in every scene. And it's- well, uh- so is everyone. And that's what's interesting is because it's, I have to say like, even doing like the HGTV stuff or like the um, uh, Food Network stuff or when they followed us around for like opera stuff. They must have loved you knowing how to do it. Quick. Yeah, but it's awkward because they set up like sort of these improvisation scenes. So you know the camera's there and they're like, okay, can you say something about him getting ready for the competition? Go. And then you see some people just stumbling and feeling awkward or uncomfortable. It happened in that very brief um, Shoma documentary that we watched also when they're just casually like going to eat a hamburger and it looks like they're just like amateur actors improvising. That's why I hate most reality TV as well. But Mark came on and gave us the kind of information, almost in a commentator sort of way, also to like actually make sense of what we were watching. Yes. So I, yes, it was very slick. It was very fine tuned and coached, but I was so ready for, for his presence there. Yeah, and I remembered a bunch of the kids because when we did the Skater of the Day for John Wilson Blades like in 2016, 2017, all those kids, War John Wilson Blades or MK and Mark had submitted like all of them and people would always be wearing like the other brand that you were not supposed to like be okay, wearing well. and then you have to like tell them like oh this is oh, not out here. here yeah yeah <laughs> for that right yeah. and then um and yeah and so that Anthony I believe was the skater of the day because I thought I've known who that was for like a long time and um different people from Sheffield I mean Mark knows how to market he could go he could work in marketing okay yeah. or self you and have to. I mean yeah. again you're basically a small business owner and you and your sport are the brand like yes. I think that's what it that's what it requires that's certainly what Dick Button did yeah yeah you need someone like that um he yeah I think uh, Queen Yevon, seeing her when she was trying to be like, um, they need to go faster. Well, that's what was fascinating. So, so you had sort of prefaced it like, this is an interesting thing because you're seeing people not at the highest level. So it's yeah. sometimes it becomes more interesting to sort of watch the training and the rise up and the struggles because it's a bit more real than a lot of the fluff we, we see about the, the upper echelon. But when they finally got to Lewis Gibson, just like skating around in a circle in like a one 10, 10 second cutaway, I was like, oh, oh, there's the real deal. Like the minute yeah. you just saw him, you were like, and unfortunately, those are the people that have to leave in order to get that training. But I'm always fascinated by um, like Sam Schwinard, who was not a figure skater, but a dancer, but then becomes a figure skating coach. And though he's not a figure skater he has quite an influence as a choreographer undoubtedly at our ring Tatiana Drushinina works with Igor now and she's worked at the Ice House in different years she's working with Nina Mosier she's worked with Moskvina she's worked with all these different people and I was just like talking to her about like oh like how'd you learn how to skate and like she just started like doing like different like rhythmic gymnastics like poses and she's like yeah I've always been able to do like a bealman and I was like God, like, what are you doing off the ice? But like, she will like chase the kids around and talk to them about their posture. Like, I don't know if she knows anything about a mohawk, but it, but Igor s- has said like, well, for some of the lessons, you just need someone to get those kids working on anything for a half yeah. hour, right? Yeah. Like they're like they're not going to work on their skating skills every which way, but if they're working on you know their hold and they're this and someone like that who's like a finisher can do that, and and that finishing matters. Or it get them does. to push through the run through, you know, like in yeah, yeah. So it it's fascinating to watch. Like Nina Petrenko who was a ballet dancer and is a top choreographer. So like right to watch someone and she can coach spins really well because that translates over with the body movement and what you're doing and all of that knowledge. So yeah, it's interesting to watch some of those coaches. Um, 
develop, I thought. And it's kind of nice. I mean, it was, I got a little irritated at some point. Um, there was a bit of like whining going on, being like, well, we're too modern and edgy and they just want us to be traditional. And her mom- Wait, when the girl didn't know that, she, when the girl told us that no one had ever skated to the show must go on before. Yeah, I and she's like, you know, we're just so modern and current. And I was like from the movie 20, 30 years ago, whenever that was. Um, but yeah, I, so I wasn't, I wasn't such a fan of that narrative that they were trying to be modern and current. But what I like is when someone like that from the outside world comes in and infuses their performance standards from their art form on, on skating, it really makes a big difference, I mm -hmm. find. It's like, okay, yeah, maybe everyone does that move, but that move is unattractive. Why don't we try a different move here? Um, yeah. And same, I've always felt that about the music. It's like, yes, you may be choosing like a staple, so it's acceptable, but it's not good. Why mm -hmm. not? Why not find something good? I don't know, it was fascinating. However, this entire series paled in comparison, I thought, to when I watched, oh my gosh, the Australian documentary. Okay. Uh, so how do I liked it in the beginning and then I was disappointed when I watched the credits because I started to feel two thirds of the way through that this was a controlled documentary. Oh. It, to me, from out the gate, it was very controlled because now I'm I'm talking out of turn because I don't really know this. My brief experience with Harry Windsor on social media has been very negative. Yeah, and it's a, so, it's, a, it's a darker vibe that he exhibited in this documentary. There was Not a tear in my mouth about him. There's no then, he doesn't give a Lila and Lewis vibe. Okay, no, no, yeah, he could he could. Um, benefit from Tessa Virtue helping him. Yeah, yeah. And and, and just the, parents instead, the anger behind it, the new partners already gone. I mean, so I, I had a, a, a viewpoint going in and it was very clear that the documentary was going to try to give me a different viewpoint on but it. I keep reading a lot of, I have a lot of other questions that I, and I think that there are hints in this thing. I mean, they, they were training in Russia that season when they people couldn't believe how much they improved in three weeks when they were training with Nina Mosier. Nina Mosier, that pair camper, we always hear about people drinking that dark liquid. Right. Um, was it Nina Mosier? Yeah. It's like dark purple, dark blue, like a blackish. Um, you know who was first brought in by Nina Mosier? Nina Mosier, who was just a junior coach until two things happened. Taras Morozov, I mean, not Taras, sorry, Velozar and Drankov. And Klimova. No, not yet. Klima. Oh, Dr. Okay. Shevetsky in 2010, what became a pair coach with Nina Mosier and also started working with Terry. And isn't it amazing that we didn't know shit about Terry before Dr. Shevetsky came and she had Shella Pen and then got Dudikov. Mm. Huh. Yeah. But Shevetsky teamed up with both of these coaches who were not big successes and right. came. And I keep reading this book and they, about Faust's gold, about East Germany. It's a great book about that. But like all these things are like, you know, what kind of a, if you stopped taking performance enhancing drugs, like what would that do to your psyche? Now we don't know that these athletes did that, but we do know that this team is very lined with Dr. Shevetsky. And what impact does that have? And we didn't hear a lot about the Russian training environment. And we didn't hear, right. Like they said, I thought it was interesting that Belinda seemed honest in some respects about, well, I didn't really like the coaches in Australia, the Russian coaches, I didn't like Andre, but it did seem like she kind of oversaw everything, right? Right. Did you notice that we never got into whether that coach was abusive or not? It like skirted the line, right? They, they didn't say that. They said he was harsh and tough but we never like went too deep. Under the guys that they're like, well, we didn't know what he was saying because we don't speak Russian. That but ultimately it. she's the overseer, right? Right. And I started to be like, wait, what does she know? Because she has a great voice and she sounds so supportive and everything. And they were like, what would you say to Katya? And she was like, I'll give you a ticket, come back. And I thought that that was so awkward. And I just started watching her and I was like, wait a second. She's like an overseer. And then you see like the damage control going on, right? Her last, what's her last name, Noonan? Yeah. 
Yeah, look at the producers. Mm. Noonan, not her, but another female name, Noonan. I was like, wait a second, does she have like a daughter or a relative that's- Got it, got it. I don't know, I don't, like I couldn't find that for sure, but I was like, wait a second. This yeah. documentary, though fascinating and told us many things, um, I yeah. don't know. And they For did instance, have a lot of funding when they went to Canada, but they were not good in that system. I right. called Bruno and he was like, well, we tried to have them get along and talk about the relationship and that how you have to work independent, like did not work for them. So, mm. yeah. but apparently things got really bad when they went back to Russia, but there's all sorts of, it just felt like there was a lot left out. For as good yeah. as it was, I, I think a book about the situation could be much better. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, he got another Russian to partner. I have found his prom I I have to tell you that you know he doesn't have a warm and fuzzy reputation. He doesn't he didn't have like a horrific reputation, but I thought it was strange when he was promoting the documentary. I did like thought that that was like a little as like a platform, I was like, I don't know that I would want a documentary about me and my because people are gonna look at. Listen, when she committed suicide, the first thing you look at the coaches, you look at the partner, you're like, I don't know, like what's going on? Obviously there's way more to this story. I don't know. I, I, like, I don't know that you'd want that like focus on, yeah. hey, like that's completely private. Although he probably thought he came out smelling like roses and I was, I'm hoping he did a social media scrub before he started doing the promotion of those videos. How about how he announced it mid- he announced the other night that he and the new partner split. He had a new Russian partner and then they split. Yeah. But Bruno said that he was very respectful to him always. Okay. But he was like, but you know, not the warm and fuzziest. It's like, okay, okay, I would understand that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Belinda, was I'm fascinated by Belinda and what, what they knew yeah. what was going on. Although, mm. here's the thing about sports. I thought that it almost seemed like they villainized people for cutting off the funding. But the way sports does work is if you don't get results. Why would you keep funneling oh. money into a situation that clearly was not working? Yeah. Now, I think it's another discussion of what do you do for people after sports and should there be some sort of health care and concern? Yes, right. And, and, now, and that's where I thought they quickly tried to wrap up the documentary in a clumsy, sort of lazy way, because then they were somehow trying to incorporate that ISU age limit change to having anything to do with their situation. And I was like, wait, this is sort of like how you've tied it together. I don't get this at all. Yeah, and I'm working on something else with like another as the blade turns, but that... Um... That age thing is the biggest window dressing because everything in Russia, all of, they have a lot of studies about delaying the period in female skaters, but let's say that they delay it until 18, which seems to be, they're like, that's the latest that you should push it off. That's even what the Russians are saying. So if you are training and between whatever Dr. Shevetsky is giving you, potentially vitamins, um, the hours of training and the lack of adequate nutrition is the female athlete triad, which pushes off the period, right? In females. If that's pushed off to 17 or 18, then you potentially have a skater who's only starting to go through puberty at the same time they're competing internationally. Like just imagine right. like then it's even delayed what other bigger changes than a potential loss of identity when you don't have the same ability. I mean, I don't know that it's going to solve well, that was it. Some of the lashback is like now you've made juniors the most competitive. If if you consider those those jumps, what makes it competitive? But um, yeah, they were like now, even Mao Shimada, I think was the highest scoring uh, free skate of the ladies this season again. You know, well, it's still no way to do it. You know, scoring. either they're doing one thing or they're just cheating in the figures. You know. Listen, Jill Trenary was the queen of women's skating and she had to do the figures, but she was a woman out there on the ice, Jonathan, and that was, 
You know, those boots were made for walking. <laughs> it was what it was all about. Her against Midori. Okay. Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> well, Midori doesn't know how to skate in a circle, but she can jump. Okay. Yeah, it, it, in many circles, high above the ice. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not on the ice, but yeah, exactly. Because you posted, I think it was, uh, was it eighty nine worlds? Yeah, but it was a different commentary. I hadn't even heard it with um, the Eurosport guy that got the sack, Simon. Yeah, just as misogynistic and weird back then. He's a big fan of Megan Duhamel. Yeah, yeah, I've I've heard that. Maybe I'll, <laughs> I heard that off the feed. <laughs> How about Shoma? Like I did, Shoma was like, I don't play video games as much anymore. Were you cracking during that? Well, again, that was the moment. So they they show Shoma in Switzerland. And again, I can't get used to it. This is the first year I've heard him speak so much. And I guess in my head, I always anticipated his speaking voice was very low. I don't know why I thought that. So to hear the high pitched quality of his voice always throws me still. And then again, this like, cockamamie moment where they're like eating a veggie burger and he's talking about oh, he's now having like, greasy meat remember he told us he's yeah, having it's like i like vegetables because now i eat tomatoes and i was <laughs> like uh okay <laughs> he's funny though he's such a different personality from yuzu and you see yuzu like posing like loving the camera and then you see shoma right. who almost seems shy in front of the camera it's just yeah, such a different he like tolerates that part instead of lives for that part and I think yeah. each theater has a different take on that. Yeah. I mean, you, you knew how to pose. Yes. Right? Yeah. He knew how to be a persona. And I think Shoma's just kind of like doing his job, but he does it very, very well. Yeah. yeah. But Yuzu was a true skater because you know how we always say that skaters always start posting during nationals and they just have a moment. Michelle Kwan had a secret birth. A secret pregnancy that came out during the nationals last year. Yuzu right. had that video come out during Japanese nationals this year. You're just like, they know how to that's strike that, when it's hot. Yeah. It's <laughs> that time in their bodies to like, yeah. Come yeah. Cue the spotlight 100%. <laughs> so, what are you looking forward to most for 2023? Oh, goodness, Dave. I wish I was a little more excited about US nationals. So, I can't say it's that. Amber Glenn, come on. <laughs> Um, I think Europeans will be a very interesting event, actually. Yeah. I think with the French men, I think um, watching Lena, I, I think some of the ice dancing results, I think, I think we're in for a very interesting Europeans th this mm. year. Yeah, so I think that's the first thing I'm really interested to see go down in 2023. What about you? Obviously, what happens with Russia, what happens with Valjeva, what happens with Diana and Glab, right? Have we heard things? Yes. <laughs> That's like your U.S. your, your U.S. Olympic lady. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh. I'll have to wait for that as as the blade turns. Then. Okay. Better than if they were representing the U.S. Twist. You heard it here first. They'll tell you you're wrong until they realize you were right. Yeah. Their backup option, the most phenomenal federation. Aha, uh -huh. got it, years. got it. I think this one I know now, yeah, okay. My true favorite. Yeah, so. <laughs> That's why you're smirking, yeah. I, I have not said, I, thing okay <laughs> i didn't hear it i didn't hear it <laughs> i just say though dave like you providing these sorts of the shoma documentary the australian documentary and the freeze episodes was a nice way to fill what has been the first time in a while there's not been some competitive skating on so it was nice to yeah. fill to fill the gap that way i know jonathan i watched i binge watched emily in paris Okay. I'm becoming the Emily in Paris. Emily in Paris. Emily. Emily. She didn't <laughs> speak French, all right? Yeah, but <laughs> Phil Collins' daughter, okay? Mm, that's Phil Collins' daughter? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah, but the men are so handsome. Well, I he... made the mistake of finally watching White Lotus because everyone was talking about it. I didn't like season one. It did, then you definitely won't like season two. It made me feel icky. I, I feel like I've seen all the fun clips of Jennifer Coolidge. 
And yeah, who is a trip? I mean, that is. I saw a man defecate in a suitcase during season one, and I was good. Okay. And that's nothing compared to what. But, I okay, I got through Emily and Patty. And I'm going to go back to some more Dave Lee's type shows. All right. Uh-huh. I'm going to watch Call My Agent is next. Okay. Okay. And then I was thinking there's this, oh, I was talking to this guy over the summer and it never went anywhere, but he was watching this show called The House of Flowers, which is like a Mexican telenovela on uh, Netflix that looks really fun. And I can think my sister was a Spanish teacher. I'm like, we should watch this. This will be fun, yeah. like January. Right. Like, So I think we're up for a third season from Ted Lasso and the latest season of Mrs. Maisel. So those Mrs. would be- Maisel. I don't know, I never did Ted Lasso, but I'm willing to try it and do it. Yeah, and I was hesitant at first because it looked like maybe straight guy humor, like yeah. soccer team, rah, rah, rah. but especially when they get into that second season, I wept and the characters are like emotionally deep and profound and there's these beautiful All moments. Right, I'll do it. I will do Ted Lasso, okay? Yeah, I'm like I'll, doing I'll, a bunch I'll, of shows. I want to get back in my pop culture moment. So I, it's so hard during the Grand Prix. It's just- I know. <laughs> I really, yeah, I want to get back and, cause I usually love a limited series. Oh my God, like- Right, binge worthy. Yeah. What about Monica Lewinsky was better than the OJ trial? Have you done that? Oh, I didn't see, I, I watched a lot about her recently. In the was, no, I thought the same thing. I thought, no, I, who, why would I want to do this? Oh my goodness, was that a phenomenal show. And then I also really loved the one about the Theranos, Elizabeth Holmes. That oh, was- Oh yes, I did watch that. Yeah. That was good, so. Yeah. I am. She, she reminded me. You have a similar wardrobe at times. Hey, girl. You know, it's... looking good in that black turtleneck. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Holding edge looks sexy, everyone. But... Happy New Year. 